Overcomers persist. That's what we're looking at here tonight. I want to look at this as it pertains to Israel. Israel persists to overcome. This is where Israel came from. Jacob was left alone and wrestled with a man there until the breaking of the day. When he saw that he didn't prevail against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was strained as he wrestled. The man said, let me go, for the day breaks. Jacob said, I won't let you go. Unless you bless me. Have you ever wrestled like that? Wrestled with God in your life? Felt his overpowering strength so much greater than your own? Many give up. Most give up the wrestling match. Jacob was a different sort. No matter what, he was not going to let go. He knew with whom he was wrestling. So he said, I won't let go until you bless me. He wasn't going to stop until he finally overcame and got the blessing. So the pre-existent Yeshua said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. He said, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have fought with Elohim and with men and have prevailed. This is probably the most glorious name ever given to any human being. It means he will rule as God. That's what is before the overcomer. Every true child of Israel is Israel. Fights the battle, doesn't quit, persists to overcome. Oh, it doesn't mean you might not have your down days. It doesn't mean that it's not a struggle. But you keep going because you must overcome. Yeshua loves that. He rewards that. But do you notice he doesn't stop the battle too soon? He is going to make you win it. You are going to have to win it. And that's what he did with Israel. We find out a lot about that in Luke chapter 18. I'm going to look at some things as they pertain to Israel tonight. Of course, we have the rich ruler. Here's a guy that thought that he had it all together. You've met those people, right? The people that have it all together. Sometimes, well, sometimes they actually become televangelists. And they get up and they tell you how they've got it all together and how, you know, you too can have your million-dollar house and your jet plane. If only you will send your money to them. And, you know, they seem to have it so together. A lot of people send in their money. But for some reason, it doesn't turn out so good for the people 
who are supporting those guys as it does for the other people. Yeah, this guy seemed to have it all together. And, you know, he kept all the commandments. Did you know he was perfect? He would have you think so. Yeshua looked right through him, and he saw exactly what was going on with this guy. And he said, well, if you're going to be perfect, sell everything you have and follow me. Couldn't do that. I could even say this man was not a child of Israel. Oh, he thought he was. He kept all the commandments, he said, but he did not persist all the way through to overcome. This is why Yeshua said, it's easier for a camel to enter in through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, this can be quite a wrestling match all by itself. Dealing with wealth, wrestling through it, and getting to the place where you really see how much greater the treasures in heaven really are, and to put those priorities in your life where they need to be. You know, when a person, for example, is hooked on drugs and that's ruining their life, they have to get rid of the drugs. There is no other way to stop being a drug addict but to get rid of the drugs. If you are a money addict, get rid of the money. Get rid of it. You don't need it. Get rid of it and follow Yeshua. Give it to somebody who can use it and follow him. It's very simple. You know, we, we know to do this with the drugs. We know to do this with the alcohol, right? We know to do this with other things that stumble us. Why don't we know that we need to do this with the riches if that is a stumbling block in our life? Something to think about. Persisting is worth it. Whatever it is that we have to part with. And you can do it, too. <laughs> the things which are impossible with men are possible with Elohim. You know, sometimes you just need a change of attitude. You might have things in your life that are impossible for you. And you're thinking this is impossible. But maybe the reason you feel that way is that you are not fully surrendering that over to Yeshua to give you the victory. We all have that struggle from time to time, and we just have to remember that's how you do the impossible. You have to give it over to him. Peter said, look, we've left everything and followed you. And you know what? Peter was not lying. That's what the disciples did. They literally walked away from everything to follow Messiah. Which is what we should all do if called upon. He said to them, most certainly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the kingdom of Elohim's sake, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the world to come eternal life. And that's a pretty scary statement for some people to read. Because, of course, that suggests that in following him, you could lose any or all of those things. You could be called upon to 
act in such a way that would result in the loss of those things. So we have to make an assessment about what's really worth it to us. You know, we're talking about close relationships here, aren't we? And yet, Messiah is worth it. And the reward for overcoming and persisting is worth it. Now we're going to take a look at the persistent widow from the standpoint of what does this mean for Israel. I believe that what we're seeing here, as Mark pointed out, as we are continuing on now from Luke 17, Messiah really is talking about the end of the age. That's what he's been talking about, and he's still talking about that. And these parables, while they give tremendous general principles to believers in every age, do specifically apply to Israel at the end of the age. For example, we have this general principle that this is about. He also spoke a parable to them that they must always pray and not give up. That's always a good thing to do, right? We must always do that. Let's look at the parable. There was a judge in a certain city who didn't fear Elohim and didn't respect man. A widow was in that city, and she often came to him saying, defend me from my adversary. Israel in exile is a widow. We've been widowed from our land. And it's kind of tough out here in the exile. And there's a lot of injustice. And a lot of us are looking for someone to defend us, for someone to get us justice. The Believer's Bible Commentary says this about this verse. The parable of the praying widow teaches that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. This is true in a general sense of all men and of all kinds of prayer. But the special sense in which it is used here is prayer for God's deliverance in times of testing. It is praying without losing heart during the long, weary interval between Christ's first and second comings. Gets long, doesn't it? Gets pretty long. <laughs> we have young people who have their lives ahead of them who have set their life on a course to follow Yeshua. For them, you know, they sometimes feel like, oh, this looks like a long road. There are some of us who have been walking that road for quite a long time. We've got gray hair. Some of us have pot bellies. Some of us have other evidence of the years that have gone by. We have met various trials. We've done better with some than with others, right? But we have persisted, we have continued in faith. And here, as we are winding down the last years, here at the end of the age, we must realize we are going to encounter special problems, and there's never been a time when the remnant must be more fervent in persisting in prayer. So anyway, here's what the judge, what happened with the judge. He wouldn't, for a while, that is, help the woman. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear Elohim nor respect man, 
Yet because this widow bothers me, I'll defend her, or else she will wear me out by her continual coming. Now, Yeshua's point here, of course, is that here's a guy who's totally unrighteous, and yet if you bug him enough, he's going to do it just to shut you up, right? But here's another thing, and that is that ultimately Yeshua is in control, and for the remnant who are out there in the world, and you have to deal with an evil system and evil people, realize that Yeshua can grant you favor through the unrighteous. And he often does that for the remnant. Trust him in that. Persistent prayer to him in those situations is probably more fruitful than bugging the guy that you're looking to help you. So Yeshua goes on, listen to what the unrighteous judge says. Won't Elohim avenge his chosen ones who are crying out to him day and night, and yet he exercises patience with them? I tell you that he will avenge them quickly. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now this is telling you a lot. This is telling you that what Yeshua has in his mind as he's telling you this parable is his return. This parable actually relates to his return. And the question, will he find faith on the earth at the time of his return, gives us a hint as to the magnitude of what people will be facing, believers will be facing, as we move towards the final days of this generation. The Believer's Bible Commentary says, the elect here might refer in a special sense to the Jewish remnant during the tribulation period. It's interesting that even the Christian commentators can see that. Well, that's what I believe. I think this very much is about Israel during the final period. So I want to talk about that a little bit. And... Of course, we can't go through everything that'll happen, but we're going to go through some of the things that can be expected where these verses might apply. We're going to talk about Basra and the persistent widow. The remnant elect must persist in prayer until Messiah returns to avenge them going to be a critical time, and everything's going to be on the table, and we must persist in prayer to make it all the way through. Well, I think you know about this part. Sometime, I believe, between 2022 and 2029, Yahweh will call his people, I believe, to Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. And these events will happen that we find in Isaiah 11 15 through 16. Yahweh will utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his scorching wind, he will wave his hand over the river and will split it into seven streams and cause men to march over in sandals. There will be a highway for the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria like there was for Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Well, he mentions here the tongue of the Egyptian sea that will be utterly destroyed. There's a couple of different ways you can look at that. One would be the Sinai area that looks like a giant tongue. And it may be that he's going to strike that, and all that will be left will be these seven streams that will be so shallow that people can cross over in their sandals. 
Some people think it might actually be, though, that tongue of water that you see on the side of that area. And certainly that could be true. We will see when it happens. But in any event, what we're looking at here is a very big thing happening. And perhaps it will be something like quite a huge asteroid strike in this area. Or some other way in which Yahweh is going to totally remold the landscape there in a remarkable way. And, of course, this sort of brings us back, doesn't it, to the first exodus and the crossing of the Red Sea. But this is talking about really a bigger act of Yahweh. And this is called the second exodus for a reason, and it is supposed to be bigger and better. And so we should expect some miracles that are bigger and better than the ones we find in Exodus. And it mentions there a highway. And many commentators believe that it's talking about the King's Highway, which is a very, very ancient highway that goes all the way back, in fact, to Egyptian times and still exists. And even fairly recently, has been all paved and prepared, which was kind of a nice thing to have happen. And as you follow that up, it goes right into the area of modern-day Jordan. So this is the plan to bring the remnant there, I believe, and this would be a wonderful place for this to happen because there's a large modern airport there, and there's something like three million rooms there at the various hotels and so forth. It's a major resort area, and it happens to be located exactly where, um, right, right adjacent to where Moses and the children of Israel came to in the second exodus and where they crossed the Red Sea. So quite a remarkable thing. So. That's where we expect it to start. And then going up the King's Highway through a part of modern-day Jordan and then finally crossing over into Israel. Now, there are some sources, for instance, the books of Maccabees, that indicate that the returning remnant will actually go to Mount Nebo, where... Moses was buried, and that they will find a cave there in which all of the original tabernacle articles hidden along with the tabernacle itself. And that version would indicate that they would actually be bringing those artifacts with them as they go into Israel. That would be an amazing thing to have happen, wouldn't it? Maybe there would even be the cloud and the fire. We have to see what Yahweh has in mind about this. But it is in the book of Maccabees. Micah chapter 2. Now it's talking about Israel. I will surely assemble Jacob, all of you. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I'll put them together as the sheep of Basra, as a flock in the midst of their pasture. They will swarm with people. He who broke, breaks open the way goes up before them. They break through the gate and go out, and their king passes on before them with Yahweh at their head. So it mentions Basra here. Now there is an actual place mentioned in the Bible called Basra, but it's not located in modern-day Israel. It's located in modern-day Jordan. However, many people, when they read this verse, they think that's the Basra it's talking about. However... 
The name Bosra simply means a sheep pen. So it's not necessarily talking about a place name at all. It could just be talking about the way in which Yahweh is going to be doing this. So some Bible versions put it that way. The New American Standard says, I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in the fold, like a flock in the midst of its pasture. Now, actually, this makes sense to me because when he says like sheep in the fold, like a flock in the midst of its pasture, saying that second sentence kind of tells me, or that second uh, phrase kind of tells me that what Yahweh is talking about is the way in which they're going to be gathered rather than a place name. And in, the, uh, in this other Bible, it says, I'll gather the remnant of Israel, I'll put them together like sheep in a pen, like a herd in its pasture. So it's the same idea. So this is what I believe about these verses. I think what it's really talking about is bringing Israel, bringing the remnant of Israel into Israel. So it's talking about the place in which they're going to be in Israel that is like a sheep pen. They're going to be in a place that's like a sheep pen. And this is going to be the place where they will be assembled. It's talking about them being assembled. So it's going to be this huge assembly there in this place that is like a sheep pen. This is Shiloh. This is a place that's like a sheep pen. Do you see the mountains all around? It's like, very much like a sheep pen with these walls around it. You know, the way they did that, I had a sheep pen in those ancient times, is they made thorns. They put like thorns, like made a fence out of thorns all the way around. And this is shaped very much like that. And Joshua 18.1 mentions this place. It says, the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled themselves together at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The land was subdued before them. So when the children of Israel finally came into the land under Joshua, this is where they were assembled, in Shiloh. And as a matter of fact, it was from this place that they received their inheritance. This is where that was all sorted out. This is where everything was all sorted out. And this is where the tabernacle was located. So, you know, if we brought the tabernacle with us, we could set it up right there. Because right there in Shiloh, they found the place that is the foundation of where the tabernacle was. And it's exactly the same dimensions as the dimensions in the scriptures. So we could just take it and set it up where it was before. I think that'd be pretty cool, wouldn't you? Do I know for sure that's how it'll happen? No, I don't. But it's pretty interesting that they've excavated all of that, and that could happen. That literally could happen. And look at the size of the place, too. Look at, just imagine how many people you could assemble in that place. It certainly could be noisy with men, couldn't it? As a place to essentially get organized in the land. Here's a map to show you where Shiloh is located. It's more or less uh, 20 miles north of Jerusalem. It's about located in the middle of Israel. As you can see, it's not too far from the Jordan River. And no doubt that's why it made such a good spot when they entered into the land for them to go there to assemble. And that would still be true, wouldn't it? So Shiloh 
seems to be a very likely place for the remnant to be assembled in the land. You know, the tabernacle was there in the land, in use there in Shiloh, and still, until they stopped using the tabernacle. So that was really the spiritual center of the entire community of Israel, the entire nation of Israel, all the tribes. This was the center of worship for the whole nation. So really such an excellent place for the remnant of all the tribes of Israel, right, to be assembled together. Shiloh means place of rest. You know, Shiloh is also a name in the book of Genesis for the Messiah. He's our place of rest, isn't he? He's our place of rest. Isaiah eleven ten through 12. It will happen in that day that the nations will seek the root of Jesse, who stands as a banner of the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. I think Shiloh means place of rest, and his resting place will be glorious. Kind of suggests that Shiloh could be the place, doesn't it? He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel. Sounds a lot like the other verses we read, right, in Micah? And gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. I think it's good to notice that the glory of Messiah will be in that place. Now, we've studied a lot of things about the remnant and what happens, what Yahweh is doing in bringing the remnant back to Israel. And is it not for the purpose of manifesting his glory in the midst of his people? And if this is the worship center of the remnant of Israel, when we go to the land, would not this be a glorious place? Wouldn't it be his glory being manifest there? And I think that being the case, this is a place where the Gentiles will see the glory of Messiah in the remnant in those days when they're all assembled together and worshiping him. I think it's interesting that it says he'll set up a banner for the nations. What a great place to do that in the land of Israel, in the midst of his people. Well, there's more. <clears throat> we know this, don't we? When the remnant all are brought together and they're manifesting the glory of Messiah, they are as his nation in the world, his restored remnant nation. What you essentially have then is the restored kingdom, isn't it? The restored kingdom of Israel in the believers there. And therefore the devil has got to stop that because that is a challenge to the hold that he has, not only on the state of Israel, but on the world. So that's what Revelation chapter 12 is telling us all about, is his challenge to that very thing that we're looking at. And this is going to bring on a change of situation. You see, from the time that the remnant is gathered out of this world, brought to Israel, and in manifesting the glory of Messiah, that's all victory, and that's all amazing things that Yahweh's doing, and that's all peace 
and that's all wonderful. However, how long is Satan going to be happy with that? Not long. So that's why in Revelation 12, it says that the devil persecutes the woman. And then this is what happens. Two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman that she might fly into the wilderness to her place so that she might be nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So we have a time period where essentially the remnant need to be in this special place in the wilderness. It says, the dragon grew angry with the woman and went away to make war with the rest of her seed who keep Elohim's commandments and hold Yeshua's testimony. Who does that sound like? That's the remnant. That's the remnant. Because unlike the Christian church, we haven't kicked the commandments to the curb. Right? Right? We do both. We strive to keep Elohim's commandments and hold to Yeshua's testimony and his strength and power is how we do it. So we've got a war going on here. We've got a war. Now, don't we have a war already? I think we do. But we're talking about a major upscaling of the war, right? This is like do or die. Now, one thing I've got to tell you about Satan, he has taken the message of Luke 18 to heart in the sense that he is persistent. Isn't he? He is persistent. He does not give up. He has... The goal of proving Yahweh wrong and continuing to rule the world. So he is not going to be very happy about a challenge to that. And he's going to do everything in his power to blot out what Yahweh is doing with the remnant in the land. So that's why all this has to happen. And so, there's a movement from our happy little place in the land to a special place prepared as a place of safety. And you know we're really going to need it because that time, times and a half, that's three and a half years in which the anti-Messiah will be ruling over the entire world. And just imagine that for three and a half years, Messiah will be holding off all of those enemies from the remnant who are in a special place. I think that's amazing. Matthew 24 talks about the same thing. It says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. So we know this is a mountain place that we'll be fleeing to. When we see the abomination of desolation, well, if you understand about Daniel, then you know what that means. If not, well, we can always do our Daniel seminar. And that's what this is all about. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. That's not very obscure, is it? We're talking about a tribulation like the world has never seen before. Now I can think of a lot of bad things that have happened in this world. A lot of tribulation that people have gone through, that Israel has gone through. And, you know, some of it, no doubt, if I really thought about it, it could make me feel a little weak in the knees. 
So we're talking about something very serious. As a matter of fact, Yeshua goes on and he says, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So there's going to be an opportunity for the world to use all their nasty stuff to the full extent. And we know they've got a lot of nasty stuff, don't we? The first thing that comes to mind is nuclear weapons, but what else do they have? That perhaps some of the things they haven't told us about. So bad that if Yahweh didn't step in, there would be no flesh that would survive. So, you know, it's all coming right down to the end here. You know, you can't flee to the mountains from Judea, in other words, modern-day Israel, unless you're in Israel. So, in other words, this is something for the remnant that had already responded and was already there in Israel. I'm just telling you, you need to fully get on board now. Don't think that once the tribulation breaks out, that there's a seat there with your name on it because you just might not be able to get there once all these things happen. Well, we're going to see some things that will tell us that the place where the remnant is going to flee to is in Edom, essentially modern-day Jordan, and it's called Basra in the scriptures. Basra was the capital city of the Edomites once they settled down from their nomadic lifestyle. It's located in modern-day Jordan along the King's Highway. As the name of the capital city of Edom, the term Basra, could refer to the whole territory of the Edomites. Just like we can say Washington and we're referring to the United States. This seems to be the wilderness to which the woman flees. And it's probably also being descriptive of that pen-like place. Many scholars equate Petra to the biblical Basra as the place where the woman waits out the tribulation. Now, there is a place that was actually the capital city of Edom that is not Petra. But that place doesn't really in any way conform to the idea of a sheep pen. Whereas Petra really does. I've been to Petra. There's a very, very long, steep gorge that you go through. I think it's about three miles long. And then it opens up into this big place with all of these cliffs like you see here. And you can see in the picture what kind of look like doors in the side of these cliffs. What this really is is these huge caverns that they carved out of the mountain itself. And there's literally enough of these caverns there to suit thousands of people. I have no idea how many people because these things are huge beyond belief. It's hard to look at that and really get a sense of the size of it. But when you're there, it's extremely huge. So this could very well be the place where the remnant will flee in the face of the satanic attack. And this is the place where they very likely will wait out the time of the Antichrist. Isaiah 34, 6 through 8 is talking about what happens at the end of that time, the time when vengeance finally comes. Yahweh's sword is filled with blood, for Yahweh 
as a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. For Yahweh has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. At the end of the tribulations, the nations will be arrayed against the remnant at Basra. So it'll be right down to it. There will be the armies of the world all seeking to wipe out the remnant who are being protected there in that place. And what do you think we'll be doing? <laughs> I think we'll be like that widow, don't you? I think we'll be persisting in prayer. But, you know, we will have been there now for at least three and a half years. And we will have seen the worst things that have ever happened in the world will have happened. We'll know about them. No doubt we will lose many friends and relatives that we love. Many things that are really crushing to the human heart are going to take place through that time. And, you know, all of that stuff is hard to deal with. So the challenge is, can we persist in prayer all the way to the end? When finally, the evils of the world against the remnant and against all of Yahweh's people will be avenged. You see, it is his purpose to avenge those things, and he will do it. But it's going to come far into the end, near the end, to give everyone an opportunity to choose who they will be and where things are going to end up for them. So we have to wait it out. But those prayers will be answered. Yahweh will avenge his people. Well, here's more. Isaiah 63. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This who is glorious in his clothing, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why are you red in your clothing? And your garments like him who treads in the wine vat. I've trodden the wine press alone. And of the peoples, there was no man with me. Yes, I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath, and their life blood is sprinkled on my garments. And I've stained all my clothing, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. Finally, after all that persistent prayer, it's time to avenge the righteous. All of this is echoed for us in Revelation, where it tells us about the return of our Messiah. Revelation 19, 11 through 13, I saw the heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it. We know who he is, don't we? Faithful and true. In righteousness, he judges, he judges, and makes war. His eyes are a flame of fire. On his head are many crowns. He has names written and a name written, which no one knows but he himself. He is clothed in a garment sprinkled with blood. Brings back Isaiah, doesn't it? His name is called the Word of Elohim. It even tells us as we go on here that he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Elohim, the Almighty. Well, where does all this happen? Isaiah tells us it happens in Basra, in Edom. That's where that happens. That's where he treads the wine press. There. 
Treads it out by himself, by the way. That's what it said in Isaiah. We're going to get back to that. But we're going to take a look at the blind beggar. Israel, the blind beggar. It happened as he came near Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the road begging. Hearing a multitude going by, he asked what this meant. Unbelieving Israel is like the blind beggar. Romans says this. According as it is written, Elohim gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. Yahweh did it. Yahweh closed their eyes and left them like a beggar because what do they have left? What do you have left when you've left the path of Yahweh? You can't see where you're going. You're a beggar. That's what you are. And not only that, but they don't even have the atonement of bulls and goats anymore. So what do they have to cover their sins? Not even that, let alone Messiah. They are left like a blind beggar. We're talking now primarily about the unbelieving Jews. Let's look at more. They told him that Yeshua of Nazareth was passing by. He cried out, Yeshua, you son of David, have mercy on me. This is very encouraging. This must have been very encouraging for those disciples to realize a time will come when the unbelieving Jews will seek Messiah's mercy. It didn't look like it at the moment with so many of them. Book of Romans talks about this, talks about the unbelieving Jews. They also, if they don't continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for Elohim is able to graft them in again. But you know, it's on the basis of Messiah's mercy. It's not on the basis of, well, you know, we have the covenant and you have to do this. It's not on the basis of, oh, I keep all the commandments. It's not on the basis of, we've been so faithful and we're such great people. No, that's not it. It's mercy alone. Mercy alone, and it's Messiah's mercy. Those who led the way rebuked him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, you son of David, have mercy on me. Notice it's those who are leading him who try to turn him back from repentance. Why is it that it's always the leaders that are trying to stop people from moving towards Messiah, from repenting and seeking mercy from him and following him? This is a consistent thing that you find in scriptures, that it's the leaders that are doing that. But nevertheless, the overcomers cry out to Messiah all the more to seek his mercy. Apparently, it's going to unfold like this. Babylon the Great will have already been destroyed by the beast. Now, what is Babylon the Great? Well, the center of Babylon the Great is the Catholic Church. But then you have all of her daughters that are part of Babylon the Great. And then the other religions of the world. All of this joined together in one big conglomerate that's kind of like an idol 
for all the people of the world to be part of, where it doesn't really matter what you believe, as long as you believe that the person we call the Antichrist is God. If you will just confess him as God, then you'll be able to have supper. Right? Because everybody will be forced to take a mark, most likely some sort of technology, that you will have to have to be able to buy or sell. And what I've noticed is that when things get inconvenient because the world is trying to push some new morality, things change in the churches pretty fast. People don't want that inconvenience. And so, you know, there's just a few little doctrinal changes here or there. And pretty soon, everybody's on board. You've seen it yourself, I'm sure. Well, that's where the world is headed. That's where religion is headed in the world, and it will all come together as one thing. And the, there's got to be such a powerful oppression brought on the world that it's pretty hard to even imagine it right now. Now, we do have places in the world that tend more in this direction, that are already pretty hard to live there as a believer. But we're talking about a time coming where the whole world is going to be like this, and it's going to be a pretty difficult place to be. Pretty difficult place to be. So what will happen? Well, what we're talking about is a global apostasy. And... I'm sorry to tell anybody who's just waiting to get raptured out of here before all this stuff happens. That's not going to happen. What's going to happen is the Christian church is going to become completely corrupted, well on its way already, and is really going to form the center of Babylon the Great. So instead of ascending to God in glory, it's going to come to a horrible end, because in the end, the Antichrist is going to destroy it all. Coming to the opinion, I guess, that he doesn't want to share his glory anymore with religion. So he's just going to stamp it out. Is that hard for you to believe? that that could happen with Christianity? It's well on its way already. It's not in any sense what Yeshua started. You know, it preserves probably some of the things that he had to say, and because of his mercy, some people have actually come to know him through the Christian church, but the form of the Christian church is not what Yahweh himself created, and the Christian church has no covenant with Yahweh to be his nation in the world. And if you think it does, tell me a verse. Find one verse where Yahweh has made a covenant with the Gentile church. He's the covenant-making God, right? All the covenants are with Israel. There are no covenants with the church. That's because the church is a man-made thing. It's not from him. Israel is from him. So, by the time of these events, these Bozer events, Babylon will have already been destroyed by the Antichrist. The beast and the false prophet will be destroyed by Messiah's coming. It is very materializing into the physical world. It's just going to blow the Antichrist into oblivion. 
So it's going to happen immediately. What happens after that? Well, next, the Lord will avenge the remnant at Basra. He finally will answer all those persistent prayers by defeating the armies gathered against them there. Imagine all the world having armies gathered against the remnant there in Basra and gathered in the land of Israel against Jerusalem. Huge. He's going to do this by himself. One reason that might be true is because his angels are already out gathering all the holy ones from the four corners of the heavens. They're busy. The holy ones are busy, but there's work that needs to be done, and Messiah's getting it done. So probably these two things are going to happen very fast. That the beast will be done away with, like immediately, and the destruction of these armies, armies at Basra by Messiah himself will happen very rapidly. And while this is going on, more than likely, the holy ones are ascending into the heavens, into the sky, where the angels are locating them to bring them back and gather them all together in one place. That's what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4. The dead in Messiah will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet Adonai in the air. So we will be with Adonai forever. Matthew 24, he'll send out his angels with the great sound of a shofar, and they'll gather together his chosen ones from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. So I think that's pretty amazing. What an incredible time that's going to be. It's just almost unthinkable to imagine it. So now all of his troops are gathered. All of the holy ones from every age are gathered to him. All of the angels are gathered with him. Then he and his forces will turn his attention to the nations who are gathered together on the Jezreel plain to make war against Israel. And the, from Jezreel or the Valley of Megiddo, their forces stretch all the way up to Jerusalem. This is the Battle of Armageddon in the book of Revelation. And at this point, when Messiah is ready to deal with them, the situation is going to be very dire in Jerusalem. This part is a lot like the blind beggar for Israel. Standing still, Yeshua commanded him to be brought to him. When he had come near, he asked him, what do you want me to do? He said, Lord, that I might see again. In those dire days, presently unbelieving Jews will call out to Yeshua that their eyes may be opened. And why wouldn't they? They're about to be totally overrun and destroyed by the enemies. And if this wouldn't convince them, what would convince them that he is the Messiah? How blind would you have to be at that point to not acknowledge him? That's like way beyond blindness, isn't it? So yes, they will. They will cry out that I may see again. Zechariah 13, 8 through 9, explains what's going on in Jerusalem. It shall happen that in all the land, says Yahweh, two parts in it will be cut off and die. 
but the third will be left in it. I will bring the third part into the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will test them like gold is tested. Can you imagine? It sounds like a siege. I don't know how long it will be. Don't know what's going to happen, but I do know that third part is going to need to persist in prayer. They will call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. And they will say, Yahweh is my Elohim. This is all that's left of Israel in the land. Only a third is left. The others are dead. And these ones that Yahweh has preserved and tested and refined, they finally call on him. And he immediately receives them. It's not, oh, you did this to me, you did that, you followed the Antichrist, you did this, you did the other thing. None of that. They cry out to him, and immediately he says, it is my people. And they will say, Yahweh is my Elohim. Don't you love that about him? It's amazing. Messiah will stand. His feet will stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, making a great, a very great valley. Now, if you've been there or you've looked at pictures and you know where the Mount of Olives is, if you can picture Yeshua standing on the top of the Mount of Olives, this is probably a very big Yeshua at this point, okay? With his feet standing there. And Jerusalem is before you. You're, you know, just take the perspective of being him. And now on either side of where the feet are, the whole thing just parts in the middle. The Mount of Olives and Jerusalem. And what you've got there, directly across from the Mount of Olives, is the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount itself is going to be split right down the middle. And the Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, it's all going to fall into the big hole. That's what's going to happen. And if there were to be an Antichrist temple on the Mount, better all go in the hole too. A very great valley, it says. From east to west, a very great valley. Half of the mountain will move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. You shall flee by the valley of my mountains. Yahweh, my Elohim, will come, and all the holy ones with you. So that, that third that's still there alive, Yahweh will make a way out for them by making this huge valley. And they're going to run. Would you run? I'm getting pretty old, but I would run. I would. I would run. They're going to run. And they're going to flee. And then Yahweh 
My Elohim will come and all the holy ones with him. And reclaim that whole area after obliterating the enemies. I don't even think you could put this in a movie because I don't believe it possible to reproduce this, anything like the real thing that's going to happen. It's huge. <clears throat> Luke 18, Yeshua said to him, receive your sight, your faith has healed you. Even at this late time, the fact that now that he's come, they've put faith in him. Their eyes have been opened, and they're healed. Immediately, he received his sight and followed him, glorifying Elohim. All the people, when they saw it, praised Elohim. At his return, presently, unbelieving Jews will seek his mercy, and he will immediately pour out his mercy upon them and restore their spiritual vision, and, of course, restore them as his people. And they will immediately follow him to the glory of Elohim. Thus all Israel will be saved. Now, the interesting thing about these believers, this third, that are saved, notice they're saved after the glorification of the Holy Ones. So, one is left to believe that all of these people are going to be millennial believers who are on the earth, mortal believers on the earth, during the kingdom period, the thousand-year reign of, of uh, Messiah. And this is how all Israel will be saved. And this reminds us of Romans 11, 25 through 27. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, we who have studied the Midrash and learned what this really means, we know the fullness of the Gentiles is actually talking about the scattered remnant who are scattered among all the Gentiles coming into Israel. This does not leave out people who are not by blood of Israel because they too can come and be grafted in. But I think the thing that we want to see here is that we should not be boasting over unbelieving Israel. We shouldn't be thinking, oh, well, I'm so much better than them because I can see Messiah, I understand this, and they're all so blind, and they can't see this, and somehow I'm better than they are. We don't want to be doing that. That would really be wrong for us to do because Yahweh has a plan and a third of these people are going to be believers one day. And Yahweh is doing it this way for his glory. So why should we find fault with those people who are a part of Yahweh's plan? And this is very important for us as remnant people to understand because when we go into the land... If we act like a bunch of stupid Americans over there, like we own the world, and like they're a bunch of idiots, how is that going to glorify Yahweh? How is that going to draw any people to our Messiah? So, you know, here in Luke 18, it gives us a lesson about humility, and we can see why that is as we look at what Paul wrote about this, and we see Yahweh's plan for Israel in kind of a larger picture. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Here's a really good part. 
This is how Israel persists to overcome. You know, after Jacob became Israel, he wasn't done persisting, and he wasn't done overcoming. He had many very difficult trials. His heart was really broken. And he continued, though, to follow Yahweh in his life, to be faithful. He, to me, in many ways, is a lot like what has happened with the Jewish people. Nobody has gone through things like them. What other people is there that have been doomed to be burned to death in huge ovens by the millions? Horrible thing. And yet, they persisted. I think we have to give them credit for what they have done. And there is a land of Israel to go back to because they went there. And they have fought the battles, and they have restored the land, and they deserve to be respected for what they have done because they have had a place in Yahweh's purpose, and they have persisted in it, even if they have not understood who Messiah is, even if they had, have not had a full understanding of his word. But Yahweh has this plan to bring this all together again, to restore Israel to this amazing unity in him in a way that glorifies our Father in heaven. And what a beautiful end result we're looking at. Well, between now and then, this is what we have to do. Persist. And when we think about where we are here at the end of the age and the things that we're going to be facing, is there anything else that's more important for us to do than this? You know what I'm saying? It's not wasted time. You know, all the time you spend listening to the Midrash coming to these meetings or watching them in the recordings, participating in them, and all the other things you do in your life as a disciple. These things are so important to you. They're so important. Keep your focus, friends. Persist as disciples of Yeshua Messiah because amazing things are about to happen. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. You know, the Apostles, they were Torah scholars. This is why I'm doing Zion Academy. The lessons include two-hour audio programs and quiz modules. All the lessons in the Torah can be applied to us today. Not to mention, they open up the Renewed Covenant Scriptures in a whole new level, much like the Apostles had understanding of the Torah. Plus, I can do the courses in my own time, at my own pace, with no prerequisites, and at a very low cost. I can do them here. Or here! Zion Academy students are provided with study materials, the Zion Messianic Scriptures, in-depth verse-by-verse programs and quizzes with your final grade and a certificate at the end of the course. Zion Academy also offers assignments for students who would like to opt in to take part in the Zion Tabernacle Live Shabbat meetings. Become immersed in the Torah. Find out how you can become a Zion Academy student at zion.org. Was this video informative? Click the like button below to help spread the word to others. Feel free to leave a comment and share your thoughts. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so you won't miss out on more amazing content from Ayahu Ben David.